I know is so explosive. <laughs> they just couldn't get away with it on a global scale, right? You, you're talking about having to, you know, every, pretty much anybody that works for an airline, anyone that does any sort of Earth observation from satellites, you know, so the whole of NASA, they'd all have to be in on this in order for it not to be detected by anybody other than these chosen few with the aluminium hats on. Um, and what frustrates me about it is it seems to be getting some traction on social media, but also if you take away the various chemicals that they say they're spraying and replace it with carbon dioxide, the term carbon dioxide, they're broadly right. So what they're seeing is a dramatic increase in, in aircraft in commercial, mostly, aircraft. And that is having a profound effect on climate. That's the story. All of this other nonsense about mind control and subversive geoengineering is just a distraction. The worrying thing is that it's a metric for how little we are thinking about future climate and how reliant we are becoming on carbon. Welcome Climate Viewers, my name is Jim Lee from Climate Viewer News at climateviewer.com. It is July 9th, 2015, and I want to update you guys on the EPA hearing on chemtrails. You would not believe the phone call I got this morning. So apparently, I'm the only person in the entire world who has signed up to actually speak at the hearing where the EPA will determine if planes are affecting human health. I was contacted by a senior official of the EPA who uh, sounded like she was trying to talk me out of going. Now, um, I've done a GoFundMe to try to get myself up to DC. I'm the only person going to this. And what I'm about to tell you guys, you're going to hear it in this recording, um, is not being said anywhere else. And I've done three years of research on this. I would like to be able to present this at the EPA hearing. And they're giving me till Monday to tell them whether I'm not whether or not I'm going to be able to make it. So um, if you guys are going to support me on this, I'm going to need it right now. And this couldn't be any more serious. I want you to listen to the tape. I want you to think real deep. Look at my material and please support me. Um, this may be our last shot for a very long time. I'm wondering what's your question, and I'll be happy to answer as best as I can. Are, are you guys not going to have the hearing? Um, no. Um, so the way it is written is that we needed a specific request to hold the hearing for someone to speak at the hearing. And um, as soon as we get that, then there will be a hearing. But, um, you know, we um, – so my – you know, I think at this point you have, um, you, we have heard from you, and it, it sounds like you are requesting um, to speak at a hearing, so that would trigger the requirement for a hearing. Well, I would like to speak. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know how much input I could have without being at the hearing um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you know there there are a lot of things that are not being discussed in this regulation that i think are pertinent mm -hmm. and uh i just want to be able to present the evidence you know there's been a lot of recent evidence in the last year that's been presented about mm -hmm. the effects of um nanoparticulates and uh materials coming out of planes that are affecting the weather mm -hmm. i've researched this in detail for three years um, and we could even go as far as to say that contrails and flight pollution, in addition to ship tracks off the coast of the Pacific, are the cause of the drought in California. This was recently disclosed at the AGU fall meeting last year. Um, okay. And it was, it's a program called Cal Water, and they're talking about pollution sources and how they affect rainfall. Um, in California. But there's also human produced aerosols and those are things like soot. You can very clearly see the emissions coming out of things like cars and trucks and ships and wildfires. And so why do we care about these aerosols and how are they influencing our climate? Well, we were brought into this um, in 2009 by the California Energy Commission because it was believed that the snowpack was going down, the amount of precipitation we were getting was, was decreasing 
And at the time, people were thinking that it was the local air pollution in California that was seeding the clouds. Basically, if you don't have aerosols, if you don't have aerosol particles, you do not have clouds. And so at the center of every cloud drop, at the center of every ice crystal is a particle. But not all particles seed clouds the same. It depends on what they're made of. And so different sources are more efficient. Some sources are more efficient at seeding clouds than others. And the bottom line is, is at the time when we came into this project, it was believed that we were putting too many seeds into the clouds. And so when these particles go into the clouds to form a cloud, there's only so much water available. And if there's too many seeds, you make many, many tiny drops, but they can't grow big enough to fall into rain. And so it's believed that in areas where humans live, um, where we're pr producing more of these seeds, we can actually turn off our precipitation in those regions. And so I had been involved in looking at, uh, we developed a tool that lets us look at what the sources are, and so we started flying this instrument through clouds as part of Cal Water to try and determine what were the actual sources that were leading to this change in precipitation. And as I say, we came into it thinking it was going to be local pollution, and as I'll mention in a minute, we actually found out that there, there, was, there were a few surprises along the way. One thing I want to mention is one of the most, one of the key ingredients in precipitation is actually ice, ice formation. And when you talk about ice being formed, it is really, really finicky as far as what it likes to form upon. In the atmosphere, only one in a million particles on average will actually give you an ice nucleus. And that's kind of the magic switch that enables um, a very efficient precipitation process. So in flying through these clouds, we we're also sampling the ice crystals and the cloud drops one by one and trying to understand what was in them. So this is just a quick schematic that just shows the two scenarios when you have polluted, when you have uh, too many seeds going into a cloud, you end up with many, many tiny droplets, and you can shut off precipitation versus clean conditions where you have less seeds, you can grow, you have fewer droplets, so they get much bigger, and they will precipitate more efficiently. Kim, if I could add uh, just one point to that. If you look at like the satellite images showing dust coming across the Pacific, you see that they're in fairly wide swaths. If you think about the human scale, you know, these are hundreds of miles mm -hmm. wide. To get man-induced seeds spread out over an area like that is not something that's traditionally been very feasible. I doubt, you know, maybe it's going to be very tough to do, but I think Mother Nature has done a remarkable job in seeding these clouds in large areas right when we need it, right when it's most efficient. And I'm saying that partly because uh, there was a study called the Sierra Cooperative Pilot Project some decades ago that looked for several years with lots of resources at whether cloud seeding worked or not in the Sierra. And the lead scientist for that concluded that Mother Nature was remarkably efficient. When there was an opportunity to seed clouds, Mother Nature seemed to take care of it. So there wasn't a lot of margin left for people to make a difference. Now that's still a hypothesis. There's a lot of work to be done. Uh, but I would say we're learning a lot more about when, when those opportunities might be there mm -hmm. that could make things more efficient if it's done right. Sure. So, um, you know, first of all, I want to assure you that, you know, we, if you, you know, feel that um, verbal, I guess, one, I just want you to know that um, the EPA weighs written and verbal comments equally. Um, so there is no difference, you know, we will take into account um, whether you choose to, to speak your comments or if you, you know, choose to um, write your comments. Um, I do need to make sure you understand that at the hearing, there's going to be a limitation of 10 minutes to present verbally your comments. And then, you know, in addition, you're welcome to submit, you know, as many written comments as you want. So there's no limit on the amount of written comments, but there is a, a 10 minute um, limit to um, the amount of time that you will um, have to speak at the hearing. Um, so just so that you know that. And there's also some other details um, uh, in the Federal Register Notice, but one thing that I wanted to make sure, you know, that you're aware of is that there is, um, you certainly can bring in personal property. Um, you need to, this is a federal building, so there will be, you know, the need to present identification as well as any personal property you bring in. You'll have to get a property pass from the, the guards at the door. Um, and there is n not um, any 
uh, cameras, videotaping allowed in the hearing room. So I, I just wanted to make sure you were aware of that as well. Okay. Um, what's the last date uh, before you guys are going to decide you don't have a hearing um, that I can Right. Answer? So um, the Federal Register, if we don't have a specific request for a hearing um, by COB July 13th, so that, that's this coming Monday, um, then we will not hold a hearing. So at this point, the only person who we've heard from is you that, um, you know, has, has tentatively put in a request. So we're, I guess at this point, you know, we, um, unless you withdraw it, it seems like you've, you know, made a request to speak at the hearing. You're well, you know, if you decide, no, you know, I, I actually will just submit written comments, that's fine. Um, but you're going to have to let us know um, by Monday if you are, because officially you've actually submitted, you know, a request to speak at the hearing. So okay. now um, that has triggered the need to hold a hearing. Um, as I said, you are the only person who's requested at this point, but we could get other people on Monday since, you know, this goes, this 10 day period goes through Monday. Okay. So, um, all right, let me, um, let me dwell on that and I will okay. give you guys a call tomorrow with a definite answer on that. Okay. That would be great. And Jim, any other questions, you know, just feel free to call me. Let me give you my uh, direct line so sure. you can get in touch with me. Sure. And okay. again, my name is Lucy Audet, A-U-D-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. Okay. And the first name is spelled L-U-C-I-E. Okay, awesome. So, um, yeah. real quick before we get off the phone, how familiar are you with the regulations that they're proposing? Um, I I was on the team, um, you know, that has uh, drafted both the proposal and the advance notice. So, um, while I'm not an expert <laughs> in all areas, I'm pretty familiar with the content. Okay. Um, well, then maybe you can ask answer a question for me since you you are familiar with that. Mm -hmm. um, I read through the, the you know the 190 page thing you guys had, mm -hmm. and um, I read a lot of the stuff you know about the summation on contrails and. Mm -hmm. The thing that, 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 that disturbs me about what I'm reading mm -hmm. is that a lot of this material is dated. Um, and, you know, furthermore, the people that provided the information to the IPCC mm -hmm. um, on all this information, they're the same people who are advocating geoengineering and talking about using contrails to geoengineer the planet. Their names are Ken Caldera, Ben Kravitz, Trude Story Elmo. Um, Philip Rarsh and Alan Robach. Now I've debated these geoengineering scientists for two years now. Mm -hmm. The problem I see is that you have an entire world full of people who hate the word chemtrails. Now you can go Google it, 21, 10 hundred million results. Right. People, people are outraged about contrails. Now I get done, I get that people don't understand the reasons why and people are confused by you know misinformation on the internet mm -hmm. but at the end of the day the guys that advise the IPCC are the same guys that are saying well contrails have no effect on the climate little to none but at the same time we're going to use them to cool the whole planet by sulfur fuel doping and putting mm -hmm. contents in the in the aircraft now i know of you know three experiments off the top of my head that have already occurred and major organizations that are talking about using biofuels for contrail remediation. I've spoken with the FAA's head of the Aviation Climate Change Research Initiative, Dr. Rang Sayihal Thori. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but we spoke a couple times and in less than a 20 minute conversation, I explained to him what I saw was the problem and he was exacerbated and said, what should we do about it? Now, I know that none of this has been discussed in these regulations, and that's what concerns me. Um, we have, you know, the U.S. Uh, 
Energy Independence Act of 2007, mm-hmm. the biofuel one. Yep. And then you got the Acre guys out there trying to sell and bill these biofuels as a solution to these con- to the contrail problem. Mm-hmm. The the other part that really disturbs me. Um, uh, what's his name? The guy who wrote the IPCC report on contrails. Mm-hmm. Um, he, when they wrote it in 2007, said that we were only accounting for linear contrails, not persistent contrails, not contrail cirrus, not spreading contrails. Mm-hmm. Only the ones that were in lines that we could see. Mm-hmm. In 2011, the same guy, he's from France, he was the lead author of the report, did a 180 reversal saying that contrails may be causing more climate heating than all of the CO2 emitted f- since the beginning of aviation. So this is uh, the latest 2007 report? Yeah, the, the 2007 report basically says that they have little to no effect on the climate. The same guy who wrote that report in 2011 Mm-hmm. said that contrails may be heating the planet more than all of the CO2 emitted by, since the beginning of aviation. That is not a small statement. No. And so let me, because my knowledge, um, the endangerment proposal, I'm in the Office of Transportation and Air Quality. Our sister office, the Office of Atmospheric Programs, is the lead author on the proposed endangerment finding, which includes the um, the uh, description on uh, additional um, potential um, climate um, effects yeah. such as contrails, and I think in there there's like black carbon. Mm-hmm. So I so I just want to let you know that my technical knowledge of this area is very limited. Okay. Um, but having said that, um, so in doing this endangerment finding, um, you know, we are, th- the original petition that we received mentioned water vapor and NOx and a number of other things that we at this time are saying we are not proposing to make an endangerment finding, not because they're, they don't impact climate, but because the state of the science, you know, is, has not developed to the extent that um, we could definitively propose an endangerment finding. I understand that, and, and I can further that. Every single IPCC model that was used, that is being used in your proposed regulations, do not account for aerosols at all. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and so I think it's a field, my understanding from our colleagues, and I'll be, you know, is that it's an area of developing science. Um, it, that, does it concern you then that the world leaders are meeting this year in December in Paris to discuss using either carbon taxes to stop CO2 or geoengineering to save us from global warming when they haven't even accounted for any those models are so fake it is just deplorable in the end of the day let's just leave all the politics out of it your regulation is about CO2 and CO2 is the least of the concerns for public health that I would put in a, in a, if I had made five points, it would be the fifth point. Because you have trade secret carcinogenic chemicals burned from planes on a daily basis. There has not been one bioaccumulation study to date. Since 1962, they have burned barium in the form of Status 450 made by Octel Corporation, originally by DuPont, since 1962. Every plane in America has burned barium out the back end of it, but you guys aren't even looking to regulate it. That's a so, health concern. Right, so you're saying that it's part of the fuel that yes. um, aircraft use and that it, in the combustion process, it, it's one of the things that gets spun off. And again, I just want to tell you, I'm, I'm trying to... Yeah, and I'm going to keep, I'll keep it very simple. I'll keep it very simple. Mm -hmm. You guys are already in active litigation over leaded fuel 
um, mm -hmm. you know, from prop mm -hmm. planes and all that stuff. So you already know about that regulation. This is aside from this, but let's be clear. If you're trying to regulate planes under the Clean Air Act because it's a danger to human health, mm -hmm. and you're only talking about CO2, I'm going to march up to Washington. I'm going to record this, put it on YouTube, make the biggest stink in the world mm -hmm. because you're not talking about lead. You're not talking about barium. You're not talking about any of the poisonous chemicals that are put in these planes to make them fly at high altitude or more cheaply. They have never been uh, tested for bioaccumulation. They have never been tested. E every single material safety data sheet for a chemical that I've seen put into a plane as an additive or the fuel itself mm -hmm. says clearly on it, do not dump into water. Yet every mm -hmm. single day it's dumped into water over our heads. And there has never been one test. Yeah, and I'm not in that area, so I... But as a lay person, okay, that's, that's that fine, I, but as a lay make, person... Make at, sure that you know, as, and that there are, you know, we are actually proposing an endangerment finding on six well-mixed greenhouse gases, which is, you know, the same six that we did under Section 202, so... You know, uh, do you, all right, let's just. All right, I understand the legal jargon aside. I'm recording this. I just want you to know that. But my point is, um, don't you understand that as an EPA official, and this is about protecting us from you know, human health from aviation pollution, to talk about CO2 and not talk about car cancer causing, Alzheimer causing, poisonous chemicals, and not as a lay person. Does it concern you that there has never been a test? So I am, you know, responding to your phone message. That you had questions about the hearing. Yes. Okay. And so I won't I, bug you any further. I, Clearly, you, know, you don't want to respond. Why don't we leave it like this unless I hear back from you definitively indicating that you do not want to speak at the August 11th. Um, we, you know, have noted that you have requested to speak at the hearing, and we, you know, do plan to hold that hearing. And we welcome all comments um, within the constraints that I've laid out to you. And, you know, clearly you should feel free, and we encourage you to submit as much written comments as as you feel is appropriate so you have my information and um do, you know if you uh, we'd appreciate a call you know on monday to let us know if you are going to follow through um and, and still want to speak um because we you know then need to um publicly notify you know, we'll be posting it on our website then that there is, you know, there's been a request to speak and we'll be holding a hearing and others are would probably make their plans accordingly. Okay. So thank you, Jim. And, um, you know, just give me a call. I, I would appreciate that letting us know because, you know, as I indicated currently, you are the only one who's officially requested to speak at the hearing. I understand that. And, um, you know, I, I find it unfortunate that you're unable to just speak with me as a lay person about this because what you're basically telling me is, here's this tiny scope. You're not, am I allowed to talk about, you know, these cancer-causing chemical, trade secret chemicals that have never been tested that are a greater human health threat than the CO2 you're talking about regulating? Or is that out of the out Yeah, of you know, at, at a public hearing, uh, each individual decides you know, what the most important points they want to make during their um, allotted time. So you should feel free to, you know, discuss whatever points you feel um, are the most important to you at, at you know, during that 10 minute um, time. Okay. I was just clarifying because you said the scope thing and I wanted to make sure that I wouldn't be told that that's outside of the scope and I'm not even allowed to discuss it. Oh, no, 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 no. It's, okay. it, it, you know, you um, will be able to speak for 10 minutes on um, whatever, um, you know, your key issues are. And, you know, as long as you know that there is no video or cameras 
picture taking um, allowed in the hearing room. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> I will give you a call tomorrow, and I appreciate your call. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Bye-bye. Right, bye.